Garden zones were developed by the USDA to help growers understand which plants are most likely to thrive at a particular minimum temperature. Here you can see this USDA plant hardiness map is based on the average annual minimum winter temperature for a zone, which helps gardeners select plants that will most likely thrive in your zone. Zone seven, shown in light green, and also indicated by the arrow, 7A and 7B, includes our region of Virginia. Many factors within a zone can influence the average minimum temperature, including elevation, proximity of large bodies of water, and warming effects of cities. Because of these variations in temperature within a zone, it's important to consider your growing season, which is determined by your first and last average frost date. This map, the Virginia Hardiness Zone map, from the VCE more precisely depicts planting times that will promote good growth of our plants. Note the last spring frost and the first fall frost for zones 7A and 7B. Most of Fairfax County, here's Fairfax County, is in zone 7A, except for a small portion right here, which is along the Potomac River. To find exactly where you should plant in zone 7, it is important to look at your growing season, which can be determined from this map. Here in zone seven, we have milder winters without the extremes of cold in the zones to the north of us and the extremes of heat to the zones to our south, placing our gardens in a transition zone between these two extremes. Before we turn to our main presentation with Kathy and Sharon, our guest gardener, Allison, is going to talk Tell us about one flower that it's time to plant in zone seven, the purple prairie clover. It blooms in the summer and makes an attractive plant for your pollinating garden. Over to you, Allison. Thank you, Linda, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna to be talking about the purple prairie clover. The scientific name is Dahlia purpurea. So this one is a perennial wildflower and it's really native to the prairies of the U.S. So most of the central U.S. all the way up to Canada. It's not a native to our area. We're more of a, a wet forest kind of um, ecosystem, but it is native to the central part of the U.S. and it does do well here in our region of the world. This is a plant that is called a clover, but it actually is a legume. It, sends a really long deep taproot down into the soil and it pulls up all kinds of good nutrients and it also fixes nitrogen from the air. So this is a great one to really improve the soil and things around it. In fact it's been used other places to help restore prairies that have been degraded by um, development, agriculture, and other things. So it's kind of a handy little plant. It will tolerate a full sun. It likes full sun. It can also do partial shades. So you've got some options. This one will tolerate drought really well. Um, it doesn't like to be wet, however. Usually those things, it's one or the other. Um, so this one is on the dry side. So if you have a drier portion of your garden, it gets a lot of sun. Maybe it's a little too hot for other things. This will do really well. It is not picky at all about soil. So you can have clay, you can have loam, you can have silt. You know, most of us in this region have clay and that's totally fine for this little plant. If it's really happy where it's planted, it will naturalize. So it will actually put out seeds and spread and grow naturally that way if it, if it likes the situation that it's in. This one gets to be about one to three feet tall. So not a huge plant, but it's a nice thing to have kind of in front of maybe some taller grasses and things. It will attract herbivores. And I think that's primarily the smaller ones because it is such a nutritious plant. Rabbits, that kind of thing will sometimes eat this one. I wondered when I saw this if that would make it attractive to deer. I would think that it would, it, it attracts herbivores, but I did see it referred to a couple places as deer resistant. So um, no promises there, but you might give this a try if you have a sunny spot where you also have some deer and just see if, um, it, will, if it will make it. 
It does attract butterflies. It also attracts bees. It's a host for the larva of several different kinds of insects. So it's a really nice addition to a pollinator garden, specifically because right now there's not a whole lot blooming. We're kind of in between the early spring things and some of the late summer. So this is a nice one to fill in some of those gaps where things aren't blooming in your yard and maybe the deer population is, is starting to pick up. So give it a try. Uh, if you need more information about this, I got some things from the North Carolina State Extension and the website is right there for you. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. That's lovely. Good afternoon, Kathy. Could you share with us the origin and history of this gorgeous species of iris? Um, yes, yeah, so we're here today to talk about the Siberian iris. The scientific name is Iris Siberica. This is an easily recognizable plant. Uh, you've probably seen it in your neighbor's yards if you haven't undertaken to plant it in your own yet. It's a complex violet flower. There are cultivars that are not violet. It's beardless and it sits atop stalks that are two feet tall or higher. So it's quite an impressive addition to, um, to a garden. So why is it called Siberica? It was originally collected sometime before 1500 in Siberia. Uh, and it was cultivated since then under other names in monasteries across Europe and even Britain. It was given the name Siberica by Carl Linnaeus, the great classifier who brought us so many uh, specific ways of identifying um, the scientific name plants by their scientific names um, in his book, Species Planetarum in 1753. Kathy, I'm looking for an attractive perennial with a long bloom duration for my cutting garden. Would the Siberian iris be a good choice for my cutting garden? Uh, it's a great choice for a cutting garden because it has such long stalks, which you can uh, use to great effect in um, a vase that may con contain only these irises uh, or can be arranged with other long stem flowers. Since the stem starts out so long, you can also adjust the height down to accommodate whatever vase you may have available in your house. Um, this plant is a perennial. Uh, plant once enjoy for many years. It's a very dependable bloom producer if it's planted in hospital, hospitable conditions, as we'll discuss a little later in the presentation. It has a wide ranging habitat. It has been successfully established and enjoyed by gardeners in zone two through zone nine obviously including uh, zone seven, as we just discussed, covering most, most of uh, Fairfax County. Um, the additional bonus is it has quite a long bloom life. If protected from heavy winds and rain and hail, uh, the blooms can last until early summer. And that's just a question of where you plant it. If you plant it on the side of your, um, your wood pile, for example, that would be adequate protection from the vagaries of spring weather to give you a very extended uh, bloom life. Kathy, if I, if I grow this plant in my home garden, what kind of conditions do I need to provide it in order to thrive? Uh, this uh, iris is practically made for what we have to offer here in zone 7A. The plant prefers full sun, but it can tolerate part shade. A lot of us live in uh, older wooded neighborhoods where the shade is a fact of what you've got to deal with in your yard. And it will do fine as long as it receives at least three to four hours of sun at some point during the day. It blooms best in the full sun. If you find after enjoying it for a year or two that it's not blooming to uh, full effect, you may need to resituate it uh, to more favorable light conditions, but it's very easy to dig it up and move it over. The plant prefers moist soil, but not, not too wet. Um, um, I generally try not to plant it in areas that are frequently soaked or saturated. But if you have those areas in your yard where it fills up when it rains, but drains pretty quickly when the sun comes out, it'd be fine to plant it in that area too. Uh, the, the Siberian iris prefers slightly acidic soil with a pH of six to seven but it will carry on in the, uh, most of the soils that nature has given us here in zone 7A. Um, after you do a soil test to establish the pH, you uh, can amend the soil to make it a little more acidic if you need to with peat moss or compost. Now to keep the plant 
uh, growing and going strong, try to keep it moist during the growing season. And to do that, you might consider planting it near annuals that you have to water regularly. Then you won't forget that you need to give your Siberian iris a little water. That's a great idea, Kathy. Thank you so much. And here's Kathy's references. Um, the Siberian iris is so easy to grow that a lot of the uh, EDU sites that we like to rely on in the Master Gardening Program, um, they give it kind of short shrift uh, because they know that you can just drop it into the ground and enjoy it for years afterwards. So I've given you a couple of um, state EDU sites to go to. Um, one that I thought was really interesting, apart from the EDU sites, was this ORG site uh, from the Society of Siberian Irises. Um, it's not a fancy schmancy website, but it does have a page uh, called Recent Introductions, and there you can enjoy some spectacular photos of Iris Siberica cultivars. Thank you so much, Kathy, for this informative information on the characteristics and care of Siberian iris. Sharon, welcome to our conversation, and thank you for joining us. Continue this discussion on the stunning flower for our Zone 7 garden. Sharon, what topics will you be discussing with us today? Well, Kathy's giving you the introduction on how to take care of it. I'm gonna mention the pests, the diseases, benefits, any kind of garden theme, if you wanna plant this, how you can deal with it. We'll mention a few of the interesting cultivars and companion plants. And then last of all, it does grow, so you, will, you may need to propagate it. So let's continue. Great. Sharon, are there any pests or disease issues that should be aware of in growing Siberian iris? Well, actually, as Kathy said, the Siberian iris is such an easy care plant that it really has no serious insect, pest, or disease problems. It's seldom bothered by the iris borer, soft rot, or leaf spot that can affect the bearded iris. However, even though the Siberian iris is resistant to the iris borer, if the iris borer insect is already affecting the bearded iris in your yard nearby, it could migrate to your Siberian. So the best way to avoid this is just good garden sanitation by cleaning up all the dead foliage around your irises. Great tips. Sharon, could you tell us some of the benefits of growing Siberian iris? Well, we've mentioned a few of them. Uh, they're super easy to grow, they're hardy, reliable, and best of all, they're just a beautiful plant. They're graceful, there's lots of colorful cultivars that come in a wide variety of sizes and colors, so they can be at home in almost any garden. They have a long-lasting flower that Kathy said you can cut them, you can bring them into your house, they make a beautiful vase arrangement, and the spiky foliage, even when they don't have flowers, they're very attractive. So if you do not deadhead them at the end of the summer, even the dried seed pods can be collected and used for fall decorations in your house. Now, please note that these irises in this photo are not Siberian irises. Sorry about that. This is Van Gogh's painting of irises and I just loved it. So please bear me this small indulgence. It's gorgeous. That's impressive. Easy to grow, beautiful, long lasting flowers. Are there any benefits to wildlife and to the pollinators? Well, actually, the, the Siberian iris can provide benefit to the wildlife throughout three of our four seasons. The tall, pithy stems are desirable for the birds in winter that are nesting, and the flowers provide nectars for bees, hummingbirds, and butterflies from spring through summer. Great, I'm interested in a plant that can thrive in a variety of habitats. Would this be a good plant to consider? Well, it's actually a very good plant in this area, but, and it's, it's good whether you stand it in the back of a garden border, or you can use it as a single specimen plant for a pop of color, any place you want. And they can be planted in mass to create a stunning wall of, of color, or a stunning walkway like you see here. 
They add beauty to cottage gardens, rain gardens, as long as they drain quickly, or you can put them near other water features such as ponds and streams. You can put them on a slope, they'll hold back erosion, and they can be also be planted in those hot areas, down by the mailbox, down by the road, some place where something else isn't gonna grow. This one, I'd give it a try. That's a beautiful picture. Sharon, could you tell us some cultivars that would be a good choice for our home garden? Oh, certainly. This one here is the Moon Silk, and it's a soft white and yellow. And there are many, many colors of cultivars. I've just picked out a few, but this one was particular because if you plant this one with the blue Siberian iris, you get a nice blue and white color combination. Anyway, the colors can range from the deep magenta, such as in the Sultan's Ruby that I've mentioned, or you can get a pure white blossom, King of Kings. Those white flowers are just gorgeous. Are there some good companion plants? Actually, there are uh, companion plants. The photo shown here, the one on the left, the Siberian iris is combined with a white spider wart. And on the right is the white Siberian iris combined with the blue indigo. People just seem to love a blue and white garden. So the plants here that you could, that you could plant with it are the, the Virginia spiderwort. And by the way, if you tune in next week on June 16th, they will be covering Virginia spiderwort. So you can get more information about how to grow that beautiful plant. They also grow with the blue indigos and the butterfly milkweed and a red columbine. So whether you want a combination of blues or reds or whites, you could get a whole patriotic theme going on here. That's just beautiful. Are there any companion shrubs and trees that you would recommend? Well, the one that I personally love, but I don't have enough sun to actually plant it, is the one pictured here. This is the American Beauty Berry. And it works really well with the blue iris. Uh, let me see. And this one also will be discussed on that June 16th virtual plant clinic on Wednesday. So if you want more information about this beautiful plant, tune in then. There's also another, the Fothergella, the dwarf one, is in the garden. It's, it smells beautiful. It's fragrant. So if you want a white flower with uh, some fragrance in your garden, that would be a good one to add. Now, if you're looking for more of a small tree, there's a Virginia native witch, witch hazel, and the witch hazel uh, harmonizes with a yellow orange flower, and that also comes out mid to late uh, winter and early spring. So it's an early one. Could you tell us how to divide our Siberian iris? Well, despite being so easy to grow, the Siberian iris can grow big and often outpaces its bedfellows. So uh, it might uh, be divided, you might choose to divide it every three to five years when it, to keep it from getting crowded. Now to do this, it's pretty easy. It's just like most other things that you wanna dig up and divide. You dig up the root ball and you divide it into three or four sections and make sure you cut back the leaves about halfway. And that way when you replant it about an inch deep, it doesn't have, it's, it doesn't have to produce energy in all those leaves. It can, can get some root energies going. So you need to water the roots for about six to eight weeks so that you can establish the new roots and then you've got a perfect plant that you don't need to care for very much. Now, if your iris does grow too large, if you haven't been paying attention to it, you've just been loving the flowers and you let it go, you might see something like is in this picture. In other words, the center of it has died out. And when that happens, it's definitely time to divide that plant. That's a great explanation. How do you propagate them by seed? Well, actually, they're pretty easy to grow by seed, or it could be pretty complex depending on if you want to do it or you want nature to do it. For nature to do it, all you have to do is collect those seed pods in September when they're ripe, and when they're ripe, they're starting to open up like you can see in this picture. They split open, and you can do what nature does. You can sprinkle those seeds wherever you want that Siberian iris to grow. 
and then the fall and the winter rains will do the rest of it. However, if you decide to collect those seeds and bring them in the house, you're going to have to do what Mother Nature does. So you're going to have to let the seeds dry out for a couple weeks, then you're going to have to soak them, then you're going to have to refrigerate them for what would be a winter, like 12 to 14 weeks, so that it simulates winter. And this whole refrigeration step is known as stratification. So after you stratify the seeds, then you can take them out in the spring and plant them. So you can do it the easy way, you can do it the hard way, but if you want more information, there's a website at the end, which is Iris of Canada's website, and they go into Im immense detail about how you can propagate this plant. Sharon, thank you for that great segue, and here's Sharon's references. Now, the one I want to point out, Kathy pointed out the uh, Iris Society that we have here. There's also an Iris Society of Canada. So Iris of Canada is a great website. Uh, and again, it's there's just so much information out about these plants and they're just so beautiful in so many colors. We certainly hope you get some and enjoy them. Thank you so much.